welcome Cara. We're excited to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I thought what I'd do today is give you really a broad overview of um, sort of our current view, not quite theoretical, but at that interface of how we think um, the brain tries to make meaning. Um, so let me jump in and say um, that what really drives my own curiosity as a scientist is that, you know, as human beings, we we kind of experience a world that feels infused with meaning. So we interact with a wide variety of perceptual stimuli. We hear spoken words and we see objects and places. We read written words and encounter other kinds of symbolic strings. And of course we see faces. And these stimuli are complex and they're ambiguous. And yet the way the human brain seems to respond to these things is to rapidly and relatively effortlessly just bring to mind this rich array of knowledge that we um, experience as the kind of meaning of these events and that drives our interactions with them. So I really would like to uncover some of the mechanisms that um, allow the brain to do this pervasive and very adept linking between perceptual stimuli and the kind of distributed multimodal information stored in long-term memory that constitutes our knowledge of them. Um, and I think this really lies at the core of building an understanding of human cognition. Um, and so one of the things I want to emphasize then is throughout my talk is I'm going to be mostly talking about um, language because uh, that's what a lot of our studies have been. But I do want to emphasize that what I think we're discovering doesn't just apply to language. It isn't specific to language. It's really more generally about how the brain connects percepts of all kind uh, to meaning. Now, so in cognitive psychology, a very standard way of thinking about what we might call this process of semantic access, and again, whether we're talking about words or faces or objects, is to assume that the sensory stimulus comes into the system and perception unfolds over time and culminates in what's typically termed recognition. So some point in processing in which we perhaps have achieved some kind of stable representation of the form of the input, and we're identifying it as a match to known form. So basically the system is saying, okay, this is a word I know or a familiar face or an object of a certain type. And this process of recognition in many cognitive models is then thought to trigger semantic processing, essentially that retrieval of information from long-term memory and the building of a meaning-based representation of the stimulus. What I want to tell you today though is that data accumulated across a large literature built from studies that track processing through time, especially using measures of electrical brain activity, EEG, really reveal a very different picture of the relationship between perception and meaning processing, showing that meaning is actually constructed directly from the noisy distributed perceptual representations beginning in a particular time window and then unfolding through a multifaceted set of temporally extended dynamic processes. So we're really removing recognition from this equation. And if anything, we're gonna put it um, somewhere after semantic processing. So I'm going to begin then by talking about what happens in that critical time window where we argue perception meets memory during what's known as the N400 component of the ERP. I'll describe what I think the N400 index is and I'll show you what work using this component has revealed about what I would take to be some very fundamental features of how the brain perceives the world and links it to long term memory to create that effortless sense of meaningfulness we experience whenever we look around or read or listen. Um, and then going to describe a set of other effects that also sometimes, but critically not always, are observed when people comprehend. I'll discuss how the nature of what I call these active comprehension effects, um, what they reveal about the differing constraints that are imposed when you're not just trying to comprehend the world, but you're preparing to act in it, as perhaps during language production in the language domain. And across these sections of my talk, um, I'll try to show you that there are actually different modes of comprehension and that those have different benefits and costs and different requirements for cognitive and neural resources. All right, so let me begin with the N400. So as some of you probably know, the N400 was first observed in a study by Marta Kudis and Steve Hilliard, and they were comparing responses to the endings of congruent sentences like he returned the book to the library with those like the now quite famous, I take coffee with cream and 
dog, and dog, of course, being the anomalous ending for this sentence. Although, as I discovered when I was preparing this talk, it turns out that Google has no problem with the phrase coffee with cream and dog. <laughs> so that is a uh, parsable <laughs> phrase nowadays, but those were, you know, that was the 1970s. Those are simpler times. All right. Um, and so what they found, um, and let me orient you to the graph here then. Um, so I'm showing you, um, back then it was very common to plot, and I think a good idea to plot, ER, to plot EEG across the entire um, sentence. So um, what you're looking at here, if you can see my cursor, is we've got time on the x-axis, we've got voltage on the y-axis. I'm always going to be plotting negative voltage up by convention in my part of the ERP field. Um, this is the response first to the fixation cross, and then you're seeing the response word by word across the entire sentence. And again, we're going to be comparing these congruent sentences with sentences that end with some unexpected word like dog in coffee with cream and dog. And the expectation given what was known at the time was that these kind of oddball language stimuli might elicit a P300, which is an ERP re response associated with low probability events of all kinds in lots of different kinds of experiments. And indeed, there probably is a P300 like response to these stimuli. But more notable was this earlier difference here um, with the unexpected words eliciting, oh, I thought I had a, a marker there, eliciting um, this, this um, larger negativity, um, peaking around 400 milliseconds compared to their more expected counterparts. And this, because of its timing and polarity, came to be called the N negative 400, peaking at 400, uh, N400 effect. Now, contrary to the impression people first got from this study, and indeed that many people still sort of seem to hold today, we now know that the N400 is not a response to improbability or anomaly or something like that, and it's actually not specific to language. So the N400 instead is part of the normal response to any complex perceptual input, basically any input that could elicit associations in long-term memory. So we see it not only to words of all types, whether they're spoken or signed or written, but also to meaningless letter strings, to pictures in both static and dynamic formats, to faces, to gestures, environmental sounds. Um, and we see similar functional and temporal characteristics of this response across these stimulus types. So just as a simple example, let me show you the responses to contextually congruent and incongruent versions of three different kinds of stimuli. You can see up at top written words. So this replicates what I just showed you from Kudis and Hilliard. Um, in the middle then is the response to those same sentences in as natural speech. And you can see again, the um, incongruent words versus the congruent words shows a very similar effect with a very similar time course. And at bottom, you can see the same thing obtains if you instead show people line drawings. Um, now, there are important overall waveform differences between these stimulus types. There are different types of stimuli, but note how similar um, across these different types of stimuli that N400 effect of congruency is. So I'm calling the N400 part of the normal response to these stimuli because what we might think of as sort of the baseline N400 is a prominent response. Basically, the N400 reflects, a large N400 reflects the fact that a lot of new information is coming online in long-term memory through associations with the input. So you don't get a big N400 because you do something weird and it's incongruent. It's not particular to contextually incongruent stimuli at all. It's also the response to a stimulus out of context, to words encountered early in a sentence. And in fact, looking at what's known as the N400 word position effect in language is one of the easiest ways, I think, to appreciate what the N400 is really like. So here I'm showing data from a study that replicates some work going back to Van Petten and Kudis in the 90s. Uh, people read for comprehension. We used congruent sentences. We um, also used what are known as syntactic prose sentences. So those follow the rules of English grammar, but they don't have a coherent message and completely random sequences of words. So if we look at the response then to all of these sentence types at the second word, so before anybody knows how the sentence is going to unfold, what you can see is that all those words, checked, cooked, making here, all of them elicit a nice big N400 response. So now people are going to progress through and we're going to look at what happens um, as we move toward the end of the sentence and bake in all cases. So we're comparing she checked the oven because the cake seemed to be taking an awfully long time to bake with sentences where there's no predictability for bake. 
And what you can see is that in the sentences that don't have a coherent message, what happens is the N400 just stays big. You didn't have any reason to expect bake. You don't have any features of bake ready. And so you continue to get a lot of new activation. But specific to that congruent sentence, what we see is that we have reduced the N400 to bake because the sentence has already handed us um, a lot of those features. And this isn't an all or nothing effect. It reflects an incremental accrual of information across the sentence. And you can see that if we plot um, now the ERPs word by word as we move through the sentence. And you can see that much steeper slope of the N400 decrement in the congruent sentences as those sentences build up their coherent message level meaning. And therefore, as it becomes easier and easier to access the semantics of each word that's coming in. So the action, the real effect on N400 amplitude is always in the form of reductions or facilitations. When because of our recent experience or context, some of the features that we normally have to get newly active in response to that input already are in play. And this can be because the stimulus is being repeated, because of priming from a related stimulus, or again, because of the accrual of information across a larger context, a sentence, a discourse. And this context-based facilitation is graded, and it's interestingly independent of the larger state of the semantic system. So let me show you what I mean by that. So again, it's been known, going back to Kudis and Hilliard, that N400 amplitude reductions can be um, well predicted by um, what's known as closed probability. So closed probabilities are calculated by giving a large group of people some context, say most of a sentence up to the last word, and then simply asking them to produce the word they think is most likely to come next. So a word's closed probability is then the proportion of people that produce that particular word in that particular context. And here you can see that N400 amplitudes are um, graded with closed probability. Um, as the context provides more support for a given word, the N400s are smaller. Um, so this effect importantly reflects the, the support that the context is providing for a particular word. So this is not something about just whether or not the context itself is predictive or non-predictive. So if we take words that have a lower closed probability, that word could be unexpected because the context doesn't provide strong support for any word. So you get a sentence like, she looked up and saw the word, you don't know what to expect. But in other cases, a word is unpredictable because the sentence provides strong support for a different word. So an example I'll use again is when the two of them met, one of, him, one of them held out his, and most people think that sentence is gonna end with the word hand, or at least they did in pre-pandemic times, um, but we're gonna end that with the word badge. Now you might think that as you build up support for the word hand in that sentence, somehow you would be negatively impacting the processing of other words like badge. So that as one word or concept becomes active, maybe others necessarily have to be suppressed. But that's not what happens on the N400, which, is, which you can see here. So what I'm showing you here is the response to a high closed probability word, this solid line, um, alongside three types of equally low closed probability words, those in which no word was strongly supported. So those are the low, low condition. Um, and those in which a different word was either moderately or strongly supported. So um, the, the high low sentences are going to be the ones that are like badge when you expect it hand. And what you can see is that there's no difference in the N400 response across those three types of sentences. The N400 reflects simply the extent to which the system was prepared for the word it got. Meaning that, right, activation in one part of the semantic system, getting ready for hand, doesn't, at least at this stage of processing, seem to have much impact on activation in other parts of the system. Closed probability is a really exceptionally strong predictor of the N400 amplitude. At the average level, the correlation between close and N400 is above 0.8 for electrodes where N400 effects are prominent. And this correlation stays high, even if we assess it at the level of individual trials and individual people. It's not only a strong effect, it's also a very robust one. And what I'm gonna do here and then throughout the talk is indicate whether the effects I'm describing hold across stimulus and tax, task factors. So do we see these effects across all word positions in a sentence, in active tasks, in passive tasks? Here the answer is yes. We always see a relationship with closed probability. 
I'll also indicate whether effects hold across individuals and subjects groups, especially whether we get them not only in healthy young adults, but also in healthy um, older adults ages 60 to 80. And here again, the answer is yes. Some details of the function relating closed amplitude can vary a little bit, but we always are going to see a clear monotonically graded effect pattern. And finally, I'm going to consider whether this is an effect that can be seen for processing bias to both the left and the right cerebral hemispheres, and this one does. And I know many of you are familiar with this, but just in case, we study hemispheric processing differences in non-patients using visual half-field presentation. So we make people fixate centrally, and when stimuli are presented uh, paraphobially to the left or right of fixation, we can use that to bias processing toward the contralateral hemisphere because that stimulus has precedence in terms of time and information quality for that hemisphere. So we can compare ERPs obtained with left and right visual field presentation to look at processing capabilities and biases of the two hemispheres. And here I just want to show you that we obtain a graded closed probability effect with processing biased either to the left or right visual field. Okay. So graded sensitivity to context is another robust feature of comprehension um, as revealed by the N400. Now I think part of the reason these effects are so ubiquitous is because more generally, the kind of basic N400 effects I'm describing here in this first part of the talk obtain even when people cannot explicitly report the manipulations or even the stimuli themselves in many cases. Priming effects are seen in some stages of sleep. They're seen during the attentional blink. Context effects can be seen for words that aren't being fixated because they're in paraphobial preview. And 400 repetition effects can be seen in amnesic patients who can't report the repetitions and so forth. So what this tells us is that important aspects of how the brain accesses long-term memory in response to perceptual input seem to be relatively obligatory and not particularly attentionally demanding. Finally, and importantly, I wanna emphasize a notable feature of the N400, which is its extremely stable peak latency. Although there are some changes in N400 latency as a function of development and aging, very few within subjects manipulations change the latency of the N400 within a person of a particular age. N400 latency is invariant to repetition, to priming, to frequency, to familiarity, to perceptual noise, to task demands, to goals, to attentional states, I could keep going. And so what this tells us is that semantic access also must not vary in time very much with any of these variables. And that's pretty interesting because many of these variables are presumed and in some cases shown to affect the time course of things that we would associate with recognition. Word recognition, object recognition, face recognition, all of these are affected to some degree in time by some of the variables I've listed here. But in all of those cases, the N400 to all of those stimuli will not move around in time. So what the N400 reveals then is that semantic access isn't yoked to recognition, we must presume, but instead always occurs within a relatively fixed time window rel compared to sensory stimulation. And so you might wonder, what does it mean to access semantic information if you haven't yet recognized the stimulus? And so to try to illustrate what we think is happening here, um, I'll show you the effect of another critical variable for N400 amplitude, and that's neighborhood size. So within the domain of language, neighborhood size is a measure of how much match there is between a given string of letters and all the words a person is likely to know. So for example, one measure of orthographic neighborhood size is calculated by counting up the number of words that can be made if you substitute out one letter of a given string. So as a simple example, if you take a word like map, it has a high neighborhood size. It includes words like cap and mop and mat. And in fact, there are 23 words in English that um, are in uh, maps neighborhood. In contrast, you can take a more orthographically unusual word like ski or a familiar acronym like BBQ, and those have low neighborhood sizes. So ski's neighborhood is only two uh, in size. Now, non-word strings like LAR and NLR also vary in neighborhood size. So we can calculate neighborhood size even for strings that don't exist in the language. Um, so although LAR is not a word, it's similar to FAR and LAP and LAD. And so we can also control neighborhood size across meaningful and non-meaningful strings. 
And there's a very strong effect of neighborhood size on the N400. And the direction of that effect is that if a word or string has more neighbors, it elicits a larger N400. So words with more neighbors elicit more activity in long-term memory. Um, and this again holds across word position and task and age and hemisphere. You will always see a word position effect. Even more strikingly, if we plot the effect of neighborhood size separately for strings that are meaningful, those are the blue dots, and those that aren't, the purple dots, we see the functions are exactly the same. And there's no reliable difference in N400 amplitude as a function of an individual item's meaningfulness. And this is consistent with what I told you earlier, that we see N400s to unfamiliar versions of all types of complex perceptual stimuli, so to letter strings and what we might call pseudo objects and unfamiliar faces. So the N400, again, isn't reflecting semantic access for a single recognized percepts. It, instead, what the N400 is giving us is a read of activity across the network with which the products of this high level but still incomplete perceptual processing is making contact. So another way of thinking about it is we're not sure yet for sure that we have MAP. It might be any of those other things, and so we go ahead and get activity associated with all of them at this point in time. Can I, can I ask a clarification question? Sure. Yeah, ah, it's about the relationship of the orthographic, and this is for uh, coming being a non language researcher, orthographic neighborhood size and meaning. So, right, because they're not, they're not uh, on the surface, they're not very closely related. Right. Yeah. And so uh, what this tells us is that the N400 is really transitional, right? It's reflecting the same thing mm -hmm. about the, the structure of the perceptual network. In this case, it's, it's the orthographic one. We would see the same thing, I would argue, for objects if we knew what the structure of the object network exactly looked like. And so per percept is hitting memory in this time window. And so I think what we're seeing in the N400 are the meaning features becoming active, but the structure of the, the perceptual network is an important determiner of that. And it isn't just neighborhood size that will do this. Um, you can also, it's just harder to measure other things. If you measure mm -hmm. how many semantic features you think this word has, more means bigger N400. If you look at how many associations this word has, more means a bigger N400. This is just one thing that is relatively straightforward to measure for us. Thanks. Okay, so as a set, I think these features of the N400 paint a picture of what I like to talk about as comprehension universals, sort of the foundation of how the brain is linking sensory input to memory to allow us to comprehend the world around us. So what I tried to show you is that first, within a very stable time window after we get new stimulus information, high level perception, still often in quite noisy form, makes contact with long term memory and this seems to be a relatively obligatory handoff. Given that sensory information itself is coming in dynamically over time, the stable timing of this contact is, I think, really important. I think it's a mechanism that allows the brain to track which long-term memory information goes with which stimulus. It, it's a messy and transient link, but it's something that the brain gets sort of for free. And this activated long-term memory information is gonna linger for some time. So if a new stimulus comes in, some of the information it would normally evoke may already be active. And that allows us as experimenters to see these graded amounts of new information coming online in response to the same stimulus in different contexts. And this lingering of activation um, also has, I think, a really interesting function because it allows the system to build up a kind of emergent representation of meaning from a multi-stimulus stream over time, again, relatively effortlessly. And so I would argue that the goal of basic comprehension is really about getting information active. That's its most important um, most important at this point. We'll do cleanup later. Um, and it's and it's part of partly because of that that it's unfolding relatively locally in this widely distributed semantic network. So activation states in one part of semantic memory can remain relatively independent of other parts of semantic memory. And, and I think this is really useful because it allows the system to consider multiple, even in some cases, contradictory interpretations of the stimulus stream at once. At this stage, it does have to choose. It can kind of just get everything ready. 
Now, obviously, this description doesn't capture what comprehension might feel like as a subjective conscious state. And moreover, it seems like, you know, a comprehension system that works this way would be susceptible to a number of fairly important errors. And I don't have time today to go through the details, so I'll just tell you that N400 patterns reveal that the system does transiently make exactly the kind of errors you might predict it would. And moreover, albeit less often, people do also make those errors in their behavior. But of course, the, the other piece of this is that what I've described so far isn't, of course, the whole story of comprehension. So what I'm going to transition to doing now is to talk about some of the other mechanisms that we do bring to bear as we're comprehending and how they manifest in ERPs. But I want to emphasize that from this point on, everything I'm going to talk about is intriguingly not universal. These other comprehension processes depend on stimulus and task factors. They're subject to age-related and individual differences. And that's in part because they tap into more specialized processing resources and therefore show some hemispheric asymmetries. And so what this means is the picture that we get from the N400 is actually what comprehension is like at least some of the time for everyone. All right, so let me talk a little bit now about more active processes in comprehension. Um, over the last couple of decades, going back to even my thesis work, research on language has amassed evidence for um, active processes, including prediction, which is what I'm going to discuss first. And I should begin by defining that because the term prediction has come to be used very widely and sometimes variably. So let me tell you what I mean by prediction. So as I'm going to try to show you, I think prediction arises from a change in the processing dynamics of the comprehension network. And among other things, what this change is doing is allowing the system to generate and preactivate likely upcoming information, for example, a probable next word in a sentence. And as a result, the system is going to behave as if it has encountered a stimulus that it hasn't actually yet gotten as input, and which, of course, it might never encounter because predictions can be wrong. So let me show you some data that illustrate this. So I mentioned in the previous section that N400 amplitudes are reduced by repetition. And these repetition effects linger even across um, a certain number of intervening stimuli. So in this study, we asked people to read sentences for comprehension, and we took a target word like hot and embedded it in a really open-ended sentence like, it was strange to hear someone call this hot. Now, this sentence provides no particular support for the word hot, so we should have a nice big N400 to hot. However, in some cases, participants had a few sentences prior already read the word hot in the context of another open-ended sentence, like he was surprised when he found out that it was hot. So in this case, now we now expect to see a reduction of N400 to the word hot in the target sentence due to repetition. And let me just show you that piece. So the blue line here, first time you're seeing hot in that target sentence, red line you'd previously seen hot, and you can see that nice N400 repetition effect. All right, so here's the key manipulation. The target word and sentence were also sometimes preceded by a sentence like, be careful because the top of the stove is very, and if you're predicting, it's very likely you would predict the sentence to end with the word hot. But we did not show participants the word hot. Instead, we gave them an unexpected but sensible ending like dirty. And what we wanted to know was whether when readers later get to hot in the target sentence, will they behave as if they'd actually encountered the word hot, even though they didn't? And the answer is yes. Participants show what we described as a pseudo repetition effect. Now, it's not as big as the effect of actually seeing the word twice, but it's still clearly facilitated compared to seeing it once. So prediction is causing readers to behave as if they saw a hot, and they're doing so several sentences later. And even when not only did we not show them the word, we actually clearly violated their prediction and took the sentence in a different direction. So this is what I mean by saying prediction involves this active generation process. And it can actually instantiate representations of likely stimuli in a way that's robust enough to linger. Um, in other words, I would argue that predicting is a form of producing. And indeed, there's a number of lines of evidence linking predictive processes and language comprehension to various overt language production mechanisms. So among other things, as I'll show you later, prediction-based effects in language comprehension are asymmetric. They're seen only when you bias processing to the left hemisphere, which is the one that in most people controls speech. 
And the tendency to show prediction-based effects can also be predicted um, by individual difference factors, particularly in verbal fluency, which is a measure of the efficacy of cued language production. Um, and this is especially true among older adults who as a group are less likely to show evidence for prediction during comprehension. So now I wanna ask, how does drawing on language production mechanisms during comprehension actually affect comprehension? And so to answer this, I think it's useful to consider how production and maybe action more generally differs from passive perception and comprehension. So one thing is we know that to produce language, we're going to have to activate representations and propagate them in the system, right? We have to move from a conceptual representation to a particular word, and ultimately, if we're going to say it out loud, to a particular set of phonemes. And this, in turn, will require us to bind information, the features that comprise a concept, the words to those features, the phonemes to the word, and so forth. And we need to create a binding that has some kind of temporal stability. And that's what we're going to need to plan and prepare things over time. And we have to have representations that are robust enough that we can simultaneously track multiple bound representations so that we can order those phonemes or those words, for example. And in fact, when people are predicting during comprehension, we do see evidence that they're activating sort of conceptual units that go beyond the features that the context is just handing you, and that they at least sometimes do propagate that activation then to specific words. So if we consider a pair of sentences like they wanted to make the hotel look more like a tropical resort. So along the driveway, they planted rows of people expect the sentence to end with the word palms. Now, based on what I told you earlier about the N400, you should expect that N400 amplitudes would be reduced for palms because some of its features, those associated with tropical and resorts and so forth, have already been activated by the context. However, this context activates very few features of the words pines or tulips. Both have a closed probability of zero, and there's no differential support for these two words. But think about it, if you predict palms and if you pre-activated the whole concept of palms, then you've got features like tree and evergreen and um, those sorts of things would also be active, meaning that now more features of pines than of tulips might also be active. And so in fact, when people are predicting and in proportion to how strongly they're predicting, we see N400 facilitations for these unexpected stimuli that share features with the expected stimulus. This is true for young adults reading word by word. Um, it's true if they're listening to natural speech. It's true if they're viewing line drawings in sentence contexts. We can also see these effects for unexpected words that share orthographic features with expected words. So if you get a sentence like the genie was ready to grant his third and final and you're thinking of wish, what happens if you compare dish versus clam? Neither of those bears, of course, any meaning relationship here, but one of them is orthographically related to what you might have expected. And once again, we see facilitation for that orthographically related stimulus. Now, as I said, though, these effects, even for these exact stimuli and task conditions, are not always observed. So we don't see the prediction-based similarity effects if we ask young adults to read quickly. We also don't see these effects in older adults as a group, either for reading or for listening, unless those adults have particularly high verbal fluency. And as I'll show you in a moment, these effects also don't obtain in both hemispheres. Now, in all of these cases, I want to emphasize that we continue to see the direct context-based facilitation. Palms is always facilitated rel um, relative to pines, uh, relative to tulips. So um, these effects of prediction are an additional non-obligatory factor that shape activation states in semantic memory and thereby can affect the N400. So what we see here is that prediction is bringing online some additional information associated with that anticipated upcoming stimulus. All right, so another important difference between comprehension and production is that production puts a much greater demands on selection. If we want to talk about this picture that I showed you earlier, we have to make some choices. Is this a puppy or is it a dog? Is it a cup or is it a mug? In the context of production, and thus perhaps arguably prediction, these concepts and words are competing and the brain needs to select among these active representations so we don't end up saying something like copy by accident. <laughs> 
So we can see selection mechanisms at work. These manifest as really yoked effects in both brain and behavior. Um, here in particular, I'm gonna show you some effects associated with selecting the appropriate meaning of an ambiguous word like park, which means something different as a noun than it does as a verb. So in young adults ERPs, we observe this is a, a ERP over frontal site. So you can see this is a negativity that is elicited by the ambiguous words and it's prolonged over the front of the head. Um, and over that same time period, if we measure fi eye fixations during natural reading, we see those fixations um, slow down. And in fact, the contextually inappropriate meaning of park is ultimately suppressed in proportion to the strength of these effects. So if you measure these effects and then you look downstream of them, you can predict how much um, suppression there's been of the inappropriate meaning. Again, however, these patterns are task dependent. They're reduced by age, as you can see here. Older adults as a group don't elicit very robust uh, selection effects. They're increased by verbal fluency and they're subject to hemispheric differences. Now, not only does the system have to deal with competing internal representations, but in some cases it has to deal with, as we saw, disparity between what you might have predicted and then what you actually obtained. So if we go back to that sentence I used earlier, when the two met, one of them held out his badge. Badge here is a sensible completion, but it violates our prediction for hand. And we can contrast this with an equally unexpected use of badge in a sentence without any strong expectations. So Sandy always wished that she'd had a badge. Now I already showed you that the N400 doesn't differentiate between these two types of words. Um, and you can see that here again over the back of the head, but um, other aspects of processing do differ. And in the ERP, these kind of plausible prediction violations yield a frontally distributed post N400 positivity. And again, these are the same exact words with the same closed probability. So the difference between them has to be due to the fact that one of them violated an expectation for something else. Again, this effect is sensitive to the task environment. We can set up tasks that discourage prediction and make that positivity disappear. We can set up tasks that encourage prediction and make that positivity come back. And consistent with the larger pattern that I've been showing you, this effect is again diminished for older adults who don't seem to be um, doing as much prediction. And this effect also shows a, an especially interesting pattern of sensitivity to lateralization because it doesn't show up for either visual field or with simultaneous presentation to both visual fields or for words that you're reading naturally but are in paraphoveal preview. So you only get this effect once words have been foveated. So it seems to reflect some kind of process that really requires central attentional resources. So in the end, then, language production doesn't just involve getting information ready, but you have to get it ready for output in the right order and at the right time. And this is really, of course, a more general property of action planning, right? To be effective actions, and we include here things like eye movements during reading, they have to be spatially and temporally coordinated with one another and with the world. Um, and so similarly, the kinds of predictive processing that I've been talking about involves anticipating upcoming items in a particular part of the sequence. And this is different from just generically activating information about the overall schema or event um, under description. So the difference between activating a sequence and activating a larger event structure, I think are really strikingly illustrated when we look at hemispheric differences. So in the stimulus set I described earlier, right, we used items that did not fit the context overall, but they did share features with the stimulus that you thought might be likely to appear next in the sequence. And I told you there were hemispheric differences, and I'm going to show you those now. Um, so these are responses from young adults. They're reading at a normal pace. The final word has been lateralized. And what you can see is that the left hemisphere, the one associated with language production, shows that prediction-based similarity effect. So it shows that facilitation for pines when you were anticipating palms. And 400 amplitudes um, with processing bias to the right hemisphere show the, the fit to the sentence. So the right hemisphere knows that palms fits and pines and tulips don't. But what you don't get is that extra facilitation uh, due to semantic similarity. Um, 
So pre-activation of the item that's likely to come up next is something that seems to arise from left hemisphere processing mechanisms, arguably mechanisms important for language production. And note that this pattern in the right hemisphere is exactly what we see for older adults, for example. And if we measure hemispheric processing in older adults, both hemispheres of older adults show this pattern here. But now let's consider a different kind of unexpected word. So these are stimuli now from studies by Ross Methuselah, who is working with Marta Kudis and Jeff Elman. Um, they gave people little vignettes like a huge blizzard swept through town last night. My kids ended up getting the day off from school. They spent the whole day outside building a big. So now we expect snowman. Now the word jacket is obviously anomalous at this position in the sentence. And this is different from the pines, palms, tulips because jacket also isn't at all related to snowman. So if you're getting ready for snowman, there's nothing, you're, you're not getting ready for jacket. Instead jacket, right, is a word that fits the general event evoked by the context. It just isn't occurring in a sensible part of the sequence. Jacket elicits a, fill, if you look centrally, <coughs> excuse me, jacket, it elicits a facilitated N400 compared to a word like towel that isn't related to the event. But now I want you to look at this pattern of response in the two hemispheres. In this case, the left hemisphere shows no facilitation for the related item. It was getting ready for snowman. Jacket is nothing like snowman. It's the right hemisphere instead that shows facilitation for a word related to the larger event, but that isn't occurring in the right part of the language sequence. And I think when we put these two patterns side by side, this really illustrates how we can have comprehension networks in the same brain with different processing dynamics. Both of these networks are building a meaning representation from, in this case, language. They're both, oops, sorry, they're both uh, consistently, where did I go? Wrong way. Ah, <laughs> sorry. They're both, um, they're both consistently differentiating the most expected items from items that don't fit. Um, but the, in the right hemisphere network, information associated with the larger event is remaining active even when it's out of place at this point in the sequence. And in contrast, on the left, the left hemisphere is prioritizing the sequence over the larger event. So it's activating even things that don't fit the, the, the sentence very well because they have features of what might be coming up next. So more generally, then, I think this really shows us how active comprehension can change how the dynamics of how processing is unfolds. Because these kinds of comprehension networks are differing in how they activate information over time, across a context. And they're going to deal with both expected and unexpected information differently. They're going to make different kinds of errors. And we've also more recently begun to show that these processing differences can really have some long-term consequences in terms of memory and learning. So let me give you one example of how predicting changes memory. So here's another version of that cross-sentence repetition paradigm. In this case, we're going to look at what happens when we actually present the highly predicted word. Be careful because the top of the stove is very hot. Now, of course, in this case, when we look at the first presentation of the word hot, we should see that hot in the strong constraint sentence is facilitated on the N400 compared to the weak constraint sentence. This is just a standard N400 closed probability effect. So then the question is, what happens when we get to the second presentation? First of all, we again replicate basic repetition effect if you've only seen the word once versus when you've seen it twice. And we saw that you can get even a pseudo repetition effect for a word if you predicted it, but didn't see it. So what happens when you not only predicted it, but you actually now saw it? All right, so you might be thinking, okay, you're gonna get a really big repetition effect, you know, predict predicted it, saw it, and now you get it. But in fact, that's not what you see. Previously predicted words do show a repetition effect compared to words seen only once, the blue line. But words that were predictable when you first encountered them don't show as much downstream activation as those that weren't predictable when you first encountered them. So what's going on here? Well, we saw that predicting eases stimulus pr processing when you get that predictable stimulus. That's part of the reason for that big N400 facilitation when you read the first sentence. But making stimulus processing easier 
also means in a sense encoding that stimulus less effectively. The brain essentially doesn't have to encode the word work as hard to encode the word hot when it's presented the first time in that predictive context. It can just note that the sentence is unfolding as expected. And by you know, reducing the work associated with word processing prediction is also reducing the strength of encoding and it's affecting then later memory as we see here. And indeed, in preliminary data that we haven't been able to finish collecting because of the pandemic, um, we were doing this in older adults and finding that they did not show this cost. They're not predicting and they also aren't showing this cost, if you will, on their memory. Okay, so across my talk today, I've shown you that there are multiple processing modes that can underlie comprehension, and that these different modes of comprehension arise from different kinds of network dynamics, and they yield different kinds of processing outcomes. So on the one hand, we've got the N400, I think giving us a view of really fundamental aspects of how the brain uses sensory information to create our pervasive sense of meaning. And I think the picture provided by the N400 is really particularly valuable because the N400 is one of the few measures we can use to examine comprehension in the absence of any kind of action, right? Nobody has to press a button. There's no verbal responses. There's no eye movements to be planned. There's no explicit judgments to be made. People really really are just taking information in. And the N400 allows us to follow that sensory um, processing to memory access when the system just doesn't have to do all the things it will have to do to act in the world. So you can just get that kind of pure passive comprehension. And under these conditions, as I've said, I think the goal is to get information active. The environment is noisy and it's dynamic. So the brain wants to do this in a way that's robust to noise, it's robust to misperception. So it's gonna make use of context and experience and statistical regularities. I'm not claiming by passive, I don't mean bottom up at all. Um, there's a lot of top-down recurrent network dynamics involved in the N400, but, this mode of comprehension is really prioritizing parallel processing. It's not committing um, and it's thereby remaining flexible enough to deal with errors and lower probability events. And it's doing that right by taking advantage of time. It's using time to create a link between a stimulus and its distributed associations. And again, this, this binding is messy and it's transient, but it's functional and it's not resource demanding. And that allows the brain to make links and accumulate that over time as we saccade across a scene or listen to an unfolding sentence. And that allows us to get this emergent set of meaning across input. And so I think this process creates a kind of dynamic spatial and temporal window of emergent meaning with a really basic representation of meaning that we get continuously and relatively effortlessly. So in contrast, though, in order to act in the world, the brain has to pare down these massively parallel graded activation states to be able to whatever, choose particular words to say in a particular sequence or a particular object to grasp at a particular location. And to do this, the brain has to prepare, it has to pre-activate, it needs to reshape activations, it has to resolve competition and select and create these more stable kinds of bindings of the features that make up a concept and form to concept and information to time and to space. And these more stable units can be acted on. We can bring them to awareness, we can order them, and if we want to, we can overtly talk about them. But the brain, of course, can only do this for a much more limited amount of information at any point in time. And when we talk about things like resolving competition, affecting selection, creating stable bindings, it sounds like we're talking about attention. And currently, several members of my lab are really actively investigating the interplay between language and attentional mechanisms. And so maybe in the not so distant future, I could come visit you for real and tell you more about what we end up finding there. Um, so I'll just conclude by saying what I've shown you is that I think the brain has multiple ways of making meaning. It leverages timing to create large scale temporary bindings for this continuous flexible interplay between the world and our knowledge stores. And then with the engagement of active comprehension mechanisms, probably critically using attention, the brain can transform those activation states into a more restricted set of stable 
multidimensional, spatially or and or temporally grounded representations, the kinds of things that are crucial, I would argue, for action. And I think this is really similar to proposals in vision. So Ron Rensick has described seeing as being made up of sensing and crewing information from the world without conscious experience, creating what he calls proto-objects and scrutinizing, using attention to create bound object representations. And so what I'm arguing here is that when we move to the next stage, we're doing something similar. Comprehension involves first connecting, getting associated information active in long-term memory and making maybe what we want to call proto-concepts, and then doing some more considering and conceptualizing, using attention to create representations that we can bring to awareness and use. So the critical difference between comprehension and production isn't sort of, you know, going bottom up or going top down. It's about the kinds of representations that we want to create to be able to use. Production uses attention in particular ways to create these new representations and active comprehension, what includes prediction, is what happens when those same attentional mechanisms are deployed then in the service of comprehending. And I want to thank, um, and by thanking my funding sources and also my um, now temporally and spatially distributed um, lab group. And I'm looking forward to taking questions and discussing. Wonderful, Cara. Thank you so much. A lot to think about. Um, I, I have some questions, but I'm going to wait and defer um, and let some other people ask some questions first. So I'll, I'll just jump in. All right, so um, the finding, sorry if I did miss something, but the finding with the uh, two park and the park, the ambiguity of there, and you said something how the degree to which um, couldn't, you know, you were, the degree of the ambiguity related to the degree to which it was suppressed later or something along those lines. So I just, yes. and I was thinking about Gary's model um, invariably like the Oppenheim model or maybe even his P-chain model, but is that kind of an error-driven learning effect then? You know, it's really interesting and it's something I, I really would like to get a handle on. You know, we, we keep we keep finding really interesting downstream effects of some of these things. So in this case, it's very clear that we can link the size of the selection effect, both in the eye movement record, as well as in the brain to, you know, if we probe downstream, we're like, oh, okay, you know, the other meaning of park is now, um, now no longer active. Um, but you know, the kinds of things that we might, that we know in domain general studies are ERPs associated with errors don't show up in language, which is really interesting. You don't get anything in, in language comprehension. You don't get anything that looks clearly like an ERN. So it's really been hard for us to know when it, it's fair to characterize the system as having registered an error and why it doesn't always look like errors in other domains. And, you know, are some of these things like the funnel negativity, do we think of that as an error signal? It's not clear. Do we think of the funnel positivity as an error signal? It doesn't have the same downstream consequences. So I've long been very, very curious about why things that you, at least on the surface, could call errors, um, prediction errors, say, in language don't manifest the same way as errors in action domains, at least. And therefore, it makes it a little harder. I mean, you know, we, it could be, it could be a form of error driven learning, but it, but we, we just don't have, we don't have clear correlates to sort of make that link yet. Yeah. Multi? Yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry, um, there's a hand up. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was actually intrigued by this. Um, by the idea that N400 is this very, it's a readout of this broad distributed um, state of activation. And I had a couple of questions about that. First on how far people have pushed the boundary of that. I mean, is social, con I mean, that sort of broad activation includes a lot more than pictures and words, right? It's facial expression yeah. and social context and all kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't, I just wanted to know about the state of affairs there, what's known. And then the second question I had is then, if it's so distributed, what should we make of source localization of N400? I mean, I, it's right. so broad. Yeah. 
So let me start with the source localization and then um, we uh, tell you a little bit about what we know about the, the broader constructs. Um, they are related. So, um, you know, I think source localization of the N400 hasn't been very successful. And I think it is because of that. Um, it is clear that there are, you know, uh, sort of hub models might be important here. It's very clear that there are some areas that are, are more central to the activation of the N400. Um, so, you know, sort of medial, possibly anterior temporal cortical areas seem to be quite important. Um, but um, I'm really struck by, and if you if you look at MEG and you look at um, or Eros sorts of studies, you will find um, superior temporal sulcus also important. Although those measures don't tend to be very good at getting at deep sources, so I think they may be missing some of the critical activity when we look at other measures. But if you look at intracranial studies, right, with the limitations that come along with that in terms of what's been sampled, what's really interesting is that indeed in the N400 time window, there's activity all over the place in higher sensor, all the higher sensory areas, in the amygdala. In, so I think there's a lot of evidence that indeed this is a distributed network and that you can find activity everywhere. And what you want to then call a source, you know, maybe some of that activity is more hub-like and some of it's more spoke like that may well be true, um, but I, I think that I think there's there's strong positive evidence that um, indeed lots of areas are active in synchrony at that time. In, in interesting ways. And, and, and because of that, right, we should see that what we mean certainly by context goes well beyond language. Um, so there's, you know, a delightful study by Van Berkham and colleagues where um, they have people listen to exactly the same sentences. The sentence might be, every evening before I go to bed, I drink a glass of wine. And the only thing they manipulate is whether the speaker's voice is a child's voice or an adult's voice. And you see an N400 difference, right? One Wine is not as, you're not as ready for wine when it's a child speaking. So you're taking the speaker into consideration. Um, there's, all the, there's other studies that set up, you know, uh, cute sort of uh, fake worlds, right, where there's a peanut who falls in love with, with another kind of nut. And again, um, you know, people will buy into those worlds and will make the kinds of predictions you would if you have an animated peanut who might be falling in love. So you can see people using all of those sources of information. Information, emotional information, social information uh, to, um, to build their expectations. And it has the sort of effect that you might think on which information is active in the N400 time window. Thanks. Tillman. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank oh. you very much. Uh, nice data and very well presented. Um, just to comment really, I was curious about this pseudo repetition effect on the N400, it, it's, uh, I'm trying to understand that. So you gave this example of the, the um, you were expecting a hot stove, but it was a dirty stove. So actually it was not correct. If this is how I understood it. The next time hot was presented, you had, because you'd predicted that it was going to be hot previously, um, there was uh, this, um, this pseudo repetition effect. And I was just, thinking about how that might occur when you must have realized that it was wrong, your prediction was actually wrong. And so you, you benefited from a repetition effect, but I was surprised that you didn't have a suppression to say, no, don't, don't predict that again, because that wasn't correct. So it's just really a comment. I, I, uh, yeah, we, we, we wondered the same thing. We thought you might be able to see some kind of suppression, but I think it is consistent with this more general view of the N400, at least, as being very sort of non-selective. So presumably hot was active, and then you went to dirty, and you did things, you know, you got that active, but that didn't mean that you turned off um, hot. And it's sort of, you know, I, I, I like to argue that this is a sensible thing for the brain to do, because, you know, it might have been dirty and hot, right? So having your prediction violated in moment one doesn't mean that down the line you're not going to want that information again. Um, we see that as well downstream. If we ask people to do a recognition memory test, they still miss, they'll sometimes miss say that they, they saw the word hot. So we can, you know, it plays out even sort of just beyond the moment of, of repetition. And I think it is a cost in general of predicting, right? You are getting information active. And if that active information has force in the system, which seems like 
you must, if why else would you do it, then it sort of makes sense that that is also going to be something that can can lead you astray, at least in some circumstances. So I think that if we probed memory for the sentence itself, people may well remember that the stove wasn't hot, it was dirty. But when we're just looking at what happens, hot is still lingering in the system. Thank you. A couple of questions, Aaron, and then Avi. Yeah, I was just wanted to follow up on that. So that makes a lot of sense if you've already learned these predictions that you would find them useful later. And so there's no point in suppressing them in the future. But what about when you're actually trying to learn what the prediction should be in the first place? Right, right. And this is where we get back to the to, to Erica's question about, you know, sort of can we see some error driven learning um, and we we continue to look for it. Um, another student of mine has looked to see what happens when you now look at the repetition of dirty thinking that maybe okay there is a circumstance where you didn't predict it and now you got it so maybe if I repeat dirty I'm going to get, you know, some sort of signal that says it was boosted or it looks it looks exactly like a normal repetition. There's absolutely no um, benefit or cost to it having been a prediction violation that you saw. Um, again, I think though that one of the interesting things when you look at models of um, sort of prediction error driven learning is, you know, where does that error signal accrue? And maybe it's not on the word. Maybe it is in what will happen the next time you get that sentence, what direction will you take it in? And we're beginning now to do some experiments which are hard where we are getting people to try to free recall the sentence or to do other sorts of sentence related memory paradigms to see if we can find evidence that um, at that level we could maybe see some prediction error driven change because given what happens otherwise we would think the system has to behave that way to some extent to learn right yeah I, I wonder also if the way to get at it may be to to ask people to learn completely novel contexts where there is no prediction either right. way and so they have to form a prediction yes yes Happy. Um, yeah, so I was thinking if they're like asked a comprehensive question after the, the stove was dirty and like asked to probe that and then you again give the stove was hot, whether that would make a difference or make a difference or not. Yeah, we would really um, like to do something like that and to find out, you know, the the closest things that exist in the literature, um, some of um, there's a, um, a segment of the language processing literature covering what's known as good enough comprehension. Um, and it's mostly uh, dealing with syntactic ambiguities where you get a sentence like while Anna dressed, the baby was crying, people initially think Anna was dressing herself and then only later um, the sentence reveals that Anna's um, sorry, that Anna was dressing the baby, but real, later we learned that the baby was not part of that construction. And what you see is that people do make mistakes of exactly the kind that you, you might predict, that they sort of, they they both think that Anna dressed herself and the baby. So there is this tendency that's been documented in the literature for people to update, but not fully update. And, and to sort of, that there's these lingering incorrect interpretations. And so something similar could be happening semantically as well. Maybe people come away from this thinking the stove was hot and dirty, right? Um, we don't know, but yeah, it would be, it would be fun to find out. question about the um, whether anyone has looked at the relationship of the magnitude of the N400 and the robustness of the experience of inner speech since and we heard we talked to you know uh, Peter Turkeltaub was here um, and talked a little bit about inner speech and certainly that's one of the ways that that's a behavioral marker of, of um, this whole prediction is produ you know production model has, has anyone done that to your knowledge? To my knowledge, no. I mean, you know, it may be out there, but I, I have not seen that. That would be really interesting. Yeah. That would be interesting. And also, you know, especially uh, the other part of it is that um, the older adults show less robust N400s, they're less good predictors. I don't know if they're less, if they have less robust inner speech. Right. You know, th there seems to be some kind of interesting relationships there. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's really intriguing. I'll, I'll have to look to see if there's anything and think more about that. Yeah. 
I had another unrelated uh, thing. Uh, this is more kind of my amusing or uh, uh, my part. It's not a, a, there's not a really fixed question here, but um, you talked about in, the, in your work about event processing versus um, sort of the, the temporal processing that seems to be what the N400 is, is indexing and the hemispheric differences uh, there, um, which is interesting. And I know Eddie had worked on some of that stuff as well. Um, but so I'm wondering, there is also a literature though on the difference between thematic and taxonomic semantic processing within the left hemisphere. So, um, the, you know, sort of and thematic processing is somewhat synonymous, I guess, with event, event processing. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any insights about why it may be that at least in some liter some aspects of the literature, Thematic semantics has a left hemisphere component, but you don't see it in your ERP studies. Right. Well, I think that um, you know one thing is that both hemispheres, and I, I think it's important to emphasize, both hemispheres are still clearly modeling you know the sentence. Right. It's not that the left has gone off and and is only thinking about the next word because it does know that you know, palms fits, tulips doesn't, and, and it always knows that, um, and, and the right does as well. Um, so it's a little more of a, a prioritization. And my guess is that, you know, given limits in how many, you know, if we think of them as, you know, sort of short-term memory limits or working memory limits, there's just a limited number of like sort of real representations, bound representations you can have. And I think the left is prioritizing representations that are necessary for sequencing and kind of in the moment now. And the right is not prioritizing, maybe prioritizing important themes or, you know, something else. And so, um, they both have a model, you know, there's a general, there's somewhere in the system, maybe not even separately in the hemispheres, who knows, there's a model of the whole sentence. And so when we, when we move away from sentences and we get down to um, word priming, we can see that both hemispheres at any given point in time will prime both associates that are more, you know, sort of thematic and taxonomic mm -hmm. relationships of category. Mm -hmm. And that's a situation where I think we have reduced demands where you don't maybe have to choose mm -hmm. so much about like, what, am I gonna focus on the sequence or am I gonna keep track of the larger topic? Um, and so I think in those cases, we see both hemispheres can do both. Um, it's just sort of a matter of what's getting prioritized when mm -hmm. their resources are limited. Great. So do you, so do you think that it's a, it's a priority it's, it's a matter of prioritization or is it a matter of specialization? In the sense, we know that, um, I mean, some of your, the data that you presented in terms of prediction, uh, we know left hemisphere is sort of this more, more specialized, at least in the motor domain um, for prediction um, of action and uh, prediction of even, you know, early kinematic parameters. Is it more specialization or uh, is it more prioritization? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I, you know, I guess I would say I think it's probably specialization, and I tend to use the word prioritization, however, because I think there has long been, there's always a tendency with hemispheric differences for people to go immediately to specialization and make it seem like left does X, Y does right, as if they're, you know, I mean, and and I and I want to avoid that. I mean, I want to go only as far as I have evidence. I have evidence for prioritization. I can't say for sure that the right couldn't predict the next thing in the sequence under some circumstance or right so that's why I'm saying what I'm saying but yeah if I if I kind of go beyond my data I would say given as you said what else we know I think it's likely that the left is going to be important for prediction if by prediction we mean uh, getting ready for something next in a temporal sequence that kind well, of prediction. yeah that, that's a comment I was going to make because I, th I was going to say that that the right hemisphere was predicting it was just predicting based on spatial coincidence let's yep. say or something like that rather than temporal coincidence and and so then it's going to be very task relevant which kind of prediction is helpful I mean obviously in language it's going to almost well not 
I guess both would be, but certainly knowing exactly what's coming next is going to be much more dependent on a temporal sequence. But there, it seems like there are many life circumstances where non-temporal expectations are very valuable as well. Right. Right. And, and you could even guess that certain kinds of spatial predictions might be right hemisphere specialized. So maybe knowing where something is going to occur in a scene, I, you know, I don't know. But right. But right. And that's why I, I think just saying the left predicts would be incorrect. The left predicts se sequentially, perhaps is correct. So to follow up on that, I mean, how much has anyone done work on free word order languages where temporal prediction may not be as relevant? I mean, so uh, yeah, what, peop, there are varying degrees of free word orderedness, but yes, I, one of the nice things about um, some of this is it has been done in, you know, it's been done in Chinese, it's been done in, so, um, but even in free word order languages, you generally have expectations, right? There's, there's typical sequences for certain contexts, and so, um, but so I think I think what gets more shaped by the language is going to be what kind of information you're predicting and sort of when you're predicting it, right? When is the verb going to come? When is it going to tell you this kind of information versus that kind of information? But but yeah, I mean, there's a lot there's a lot of fun things that could be done with different kinds of language structures and when you know certain things and when you don't. Yeah, I mean, I guess the pie in the sky experiment, but if you find bilinguals who speak one rigid word order and one free order word order, you might expect a certain reduction in, in the freer word order, right? I right, right, right. I was gonna ask about going back to, um, I think the study you started with where um, you, you were talking about the size of the orthographic neighborhood and the size of the semantic neighborhood. So, and you talked about the N400 as representing some kind of maybe transitional stage where the information is kind of, it's the amount of information that's activated. And so is, does that scale with amount of information activated across processing stages? So if you have a, a big orthographic neighborhood and a big semantic neighborhood, are you going are you going to get a bigger N four hundred because you have less predictability, you know, across you know across the whole system? Has anyone looked at playing with those stages relative well, to one another? We, we, I mean, the, the orthographic effects and the sort of semantic density effects are additive as far as we can tell. Additive, that's what um, I was wondering. Uh -huh. yeah. um, so mm -hmm. at that sense, and, and I mean, there, there are other stages. So, you know, prior to the N400, there's for things like objects, there are N300s that sort of behave in some ways N400-like, but seem to reflect really more visual properties. And those also have a similar scaling so that things that are more statistically irregular and don't have as clear of a maybe a template representation if you want are bigger so it, it's interesting it seems like the system does this kind of you know s almost sequential um recursive dynamic you know walk mm -hmm. through the system right and so mm -hmm. the n400 is kind of the maybe the end stage of that um of sort of you know perception kind of naturally going into this much broader associative network and then beyond that you start cleaning everything up yeah i mean it's interesting when you think about our patients um you know people like erica and i'll be in the language researchers um study the the, the processing stage that the, the psychoanalinguistic analysis of the stages at which people are having trouble accessing words and um I, it i don't know whether these this work kind of work that you do cara has could or has shed any light on the places where aphasics might be having difficulty and sort of what what you what you might expect um in terms of the magnitude of the n400 in that case right i mean there is some work on n400s and aphasia and it, it, it you know it does suggest that you know um, and there's some work in semantic dementia as well, which is, you know, pretty interesting. Um, and, and, I, I, and the general idea is that, you know, it, there is a relationship with the size of the N400 effect to certain aspects of um, how, 
bad the aphasia is. Um, but, you know, part of what's hard is that a lot of aphasia is a production problem and a lot of N400 is a intake measure. And so like where are the boundaries of like, are you predicting? And it, it you know, if you're aphasic, probably you're also going to have problems predicting, but at what's, but what, what level? I don't know. There's a lot, there's a lot to be done, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kara. So I'm, I'm Elon. I, I was a um, uh, Charlie Lee's student in Taiwan. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> hi, Laura. And um, so now I'm a PhD student at University of Delaware. So I work with Dr. Zhen Hanqi. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And then um, so uh, we are my mainly my research mainly focus on prediction. And I use simultaneous uh, eye tracking and EEG technique and also combine with machine learning to study the neural marker of prediction in uh, during the sen sentence reading. Nice. So yeah, it's very interesting. And thank you for your wonderful talk today. And I have a quick question about the N400 effect. So we know that most of the study, uh, the target words are always the in the, uh, the final words is all our, the final words of a sentence. So, and then we tie lock to the um, the words like unsaid for the target word, right? So do you think, um, is it like the N400, can we say that it's actually the, the outcome or the prediction? Oh yeah, no, I don't think so because- Oh, okay. okay. Because of things like the word position effect. So, you know, um, it's true that much of the work has been done with sentence final because that's a stage where it's really easy to yeah. measure close probabilities and, you know, manipulate predictions and things like that. Um, but we've looked at N400s across the whole sentence, and they're they're susceptible to the same sorts of prediction, to, to the same sort of contextual fit manipulations across the whole sentence. And in fact, we've started using natural uh, language models um, to be able to have very fine-grained predictions about the you know word surprisal, say at every point in a sentence, and it, you can get really nice predictions of N400 amplitude across the whole sentence, even for very, very, even when you reach the sort of limits of closed probability where no human is going to predict that this word is a little bit more expected than this word, but a language model can tell you that and you can see N400 differences there. So I don't think there's anything super special about the end of the sentence, but I mean, it is the case that I've described sort of two kinds of N400 effects, right? The sort of general building up of context, which always affects the N4, and then more specifically active prediction, which will also affect semantics in the N4. And it's true that, right, you might get more active prediction as you move along a sentence because you have the information necessary to make those active predictions. So I do think you could begin to see some influences on the N400 manifest um, uh, more so as you move across a predictive context like a sentence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I also have another question. It's like, um, because I'm also curious, like when does prediction occur during the sentence processing? Yes. So that's like my uh, like main project right now. So that's why I, I combine the eye tracking and EEG. So we know that uh, for uh, many eye movement study, there's an anticipatory looking. So I just use that um, and this was looking as a like marker index to time like my EEG. Nice. And then mm -hmm. so that I, uh, in, and then we can like to analyze the EEG at that time window to see. And right now we found a very interesting negativity in that time window. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's like my like current research right now. That's so really I am. Really yeah, nice. I'm, I'm just wondering whether it's uh, related to an uh, N400. <laughs> yeah, that would uh, be really prediction. interesting. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that is very intriguing about um, the N400 is that there's sometimes a, a kind of a push-pull that you can see that makes me wonder whether this could be related to your effect. So if you give someone, um, if you're going to give someone a sentence like, uh, the man, um, 
led the orchestra versus the man conducted the orchestra, right? So if you compare at the point of the verb in English, conducted has a lot more predictive information. So people are much better at getting to orchestra after conducted than just led, right? So if you look at the N400 at that point, it's bigger to conducted than to, to led because conducted seems to be bringing online more semantic information at that point. Then later, if you go to orchestra, when you, you'll you get a smaller N400 to orchestra after conducted than after led, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of a, a shift in when that information became active. In one case, the verb gave it to you, so you got it ready there. Uh -huh. In the other case, you had to wait for the noun to get it. And I think these are really interesting questions that I'm, I'm really glad you're doing that. Um, in my lab, one of the things we've started doing is using a technique known as representational similarity analysis to try to mm -hmm. get at these questions yeah. as well. So, you know, measuring, you know, if you take the sentence, the top of the stove was hot. If we know what the pattern of EEG activity at hot is, we can slide that back across the sentence and try to see when people got ready for hot. And in our first uh, foray into this domain, what we've been finding is that it's very carefully timed that people are getting at ready for hot, the word before hot. But if you go back one more word, they're not ready for hot, which again, I think is really interesting in putting in language prediction into a sequencing sort of process. You know, you're not just generically get, and maybe the right hemisphere generically gets ready for jacket all the time, I don't know. But the left hemisphere, that kind of a process at least seems to be, um, I'm gonna get ready for the word right before the word is about to occur. Um, and so, but yes, I think there are so many interesting questions about not just, you know, now that we've gotten beyond, are we predicting and kind of at what level are we predicting, but when, when are we predicting? Yeah. So I look forward to, to following your work. That's great. Thank you. I was just wondering, since it seems so temporally relevant, does it matter if you drop an article or a pronoun out of a word or out of a sentence? Right. Um, we are, right, there's, there's super interesting questions of that. We haven't done that particular experiment. What happens if you drop a word? And of course, um, there's very interesting cross-linguistic sort of things to do there because English doesn't allow you to do that, but other languages would for predictable words, exactly. Um, we sort of right now have loosely taken the other tactic of, let's say you're getting really ready for a noun. What happens if I derail you by giving you an adjective that either, you know, you were ready for the noun, but now you get an adjective and maybe you still predict the noun. But what happens if I give you an adjective that should change your prediction and trying to watch whether the system can kind of, you know, cycle back. Uh, and it seems like it can. It seems like um, adjectives do allow people to rapidly change. But the interesting thing about it is you don't see anything at the adjective itself. You see it at the noun. And that suggests to us that, um, you know, that there's also, in, in, for some language constructions, there's, um, you have to wait, say, for the, the head of the phrase. You have to know what it is that the adjective is going to attach to so that you might have to do some buffering of some information and kind of have your sentence and have your new information and then put them together at the point when you get the, the noun. But yeah, I think there, there's some really fun sort of lines to go down where we try to disrupt the processing in various ways. Any other questions or comments? Okay, well, if there are no more comments or questions for Cara, we thank you so much, Cara. This was really, really interesting and relevant to the work that a lot of us do. Thanks. Thank you for having and me. It's really fun. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.